Um, I'm David Wessel, director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. Um, uh, uh, we're now gonna turn our conversation to thinking a little bit about the um, implications of the Fed's new statement. Uh, I do wanna thank our technical people for making this uh, so seamless so far, knock on wood, uh, as we all know that sometimes events beyond our control can, can uh, interfere, um, but hopefully that won't happen today. So um, our plan today is I'm joined by Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, who are of course, former chairs of the Federal Reserve and my colleagues at Brookings, uh, and Roberto Perley and Julia Coronado, both of whom have in the past worked at the Fed, but now are in the private sector, helping people in the markets and the public understand what the Fed is doing and giving the Fed advice, whether it wants it or not. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, as our practice, I want to acknowledge that Julia Coronado has been a supporter of the Economic Studies Council at Brookings, which gives unrestricted support, and we're grateful for that. Um, uh, as before, uh, if you're online and you want to pose a question on the chat or the Q&A function, that's fine. If not, you can email it to Brookings, uh, rather events, excuse me, at brookings.edu, and someone will send it to me. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to start, uh, Ben, with you, if I might. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about whether this policy statement really matters or not. Um, uh, you are the, you began the nation of having a the notion of having a long-term statement of, of uh, policy. So I'm curious whether you think that um, this, with interest rates so close to zero, and the Fed really can't do a whole lot right now. Will this new strategy increase the potency of monetary policy? And does it matter that they were so lacking in specifics about how much of an overshoot they'll tolerate, how long they're going to average inflation, and what tools they'll use to get there? Yeah, I think I think it will strengthen monetary policy. There's a lot of evidence that so-called makeup policies where you uh, make up for a shortfall inflation by overshooting um, creates a lower for longer dynamic. Markets expect uh, policy to stay easier longer. And that in turn adds accommodation even while rates remain at zero. The uh, simple twist of fate, which is the new policy, um, is uh, very similar to uh, something I proposed called the temporary price level target which uh, had the basic idea, again, of uh, trying to average inflation over a period of time. I did some work with uh, Michael Kiley and John Roberts of the Fed, where we looked at, among other things, uh, a policy that averaged uh, looking back a year, so that if, if inflation was below target for a year, then you kept it above target long enough to get back to a two-year average. And we found that that made uh, some difference, even if in our simulations, even if uh, only markets and not the general public understood what the Fed was about. So lower for longer policies are effective. I'm sure Janet will talk about this too. She's advocated this as well. And it is one way to um, get around the, the zero lower bound. A another aspect of this is that by having an upward bias uh, on inflation when you're away from zero, you uh, hope to keep inflation expectations better anchored around 2%, which again gives more space in the long run and the simulations I was describing just assumed that inflation was expectations were anchored. That's not always true, and this will help do that. So I think, in principle, this approach uh, will create a, a little bit more inflation and will give a little bit more space to policy. Now, it is true that uh, the way this has been laid out, it's not very explicit. You talked about this with, with Lael. Uh, they don't talk about what the period for averaging is, for example, of how quickly you, you get there and so on. I just would point out that the statement that they have agreed upon is, you can think of it as a constitutional statement. It sort of just lays out general principles, but it does not obviously give specific numerical quantities. And there are a couple of things that are gonna help us understand better specifically what this is gonna mean. Number one, I expect you know, sometime this fall, the Fed will come out with explicit forward guidance that will presumably tie rate policy either to time or to the state of the economy, perhaps to the level of inflation, that will give us some more quantitative sense of how they envision meeting this, uh, this standard. The other quantitative criterion, one of the main reasons for doing this is to keep inflation expectations close to 2%. Now we don't have precise measures of inflation expectations, but I would think that 
monitoring inflation expectations and is making sure that uh, they're close to 2% is a constraint that will uh, quantitatively help us assess whether they're meeting this uh, policy goal. I, I don't have much to say about tools. They have um, reaffirmed the use of quantitative easing and forward guidance. Um, they've talked about other things like yield caps and, and negative rates. Um, the basic principle of, of central banking is you don't speculate about things until you're about ready to use them. So I wouldn't take, particularly about yield caps, I wouldn't take the somewhat mixed message we've been getting as, as ruling this out as something they might wanna do in the future under, under appropriate circumstances. Um, but there are tools I think that would be helpful to, to reach this, uh, this target uh, in the longer term. Now we're, I, I should end by saying that we're in a, in a very special circumstance that the, the COVID-19 recession is different in many, many ways from a standard recession. And I, I don't think, I, I don't think this uh, is inconsistent with things I've said in the past. I don't think that monetary policy is the tool that's gonna get us out of this recession. Number one by far is gonna be the public health situation and getting that under control. Fiscal policy also has a very big role to play. Monetary policy can be helpful, but given this particular set of circumstances, um, it's, it's not going to be the most important player in getting us back to full employment. Right. Because I recall in your American Economic Association address and the work you did with Kylie and Roberts, you said the Fed had sufficient tools provided that the natural rate of interest was uh, somewhat higher than we believe it is today. Well, that's not quite true in that, the, I mean, the Fed's official, official, the SEP, the Summary of Economic Projections, has the uh, natural rate of interest around two and a half percent. And my conclusion from simulations was that with interest rates between two and 3%, that the tools we have can get us pretty much back to where we were before the constraint was binding. Uh, but that's a different situation from now. What you can think about now is that at least for the time being, uh, the fact that people are not spending because they're staying home means essentially that the IS curve has been, you know, at least temporarily pushed down that the neutral rate is lower than normal. So uh, my, my results from the, from the lecture may apply in the longer term, but right now I think that monetary policy doesn't have by itself the power to overcome the effects of the, of the virus. Thank you. Um, so Janet Yellen, uh, uh, Governor Brainerd talked about how this new statement would have changed policy in the recent past, including the years during which you were Fed chairman. So I'm just curious whether you see it the same way. Would it have made a difference if this had been the Fed statement when you were raising interest rates in 2015, 16, 17, and 18? Well, I think it would have made a small difference. I don't think it would have made a huge difference. Um, we, we Our forecast at the time we began to raise rates was that inflation was going back to 2% um, over the next year or two. The unemployment rate had already declined to levels I believe we thought were normal in the longer run. So we envisioned the economy, frankly, as... Um, expanding beyond the natural rate of unemployment. Um, we wanted to be somewhat preemptive uh, in the sense we saw us having our foot firmly on the gas pedal. And as things were getting back to normal, both in the labor market and with respect to inflation, we thought it appropriate to um, take our foot off the gas pedal a little bit but it's by no means the case that we slammed on the brakes. We had 50 basis points increase in 2015, um, another 50 points in 2016. Um, that was certainly not enough to halt the expansion. And even with the later increases that Chair Powell had, the labor market continued to improve in unemployment to drop to a 50-year low. So um, I, I think it's fair to say if our goal had been to overshoot 2% inflation, um, 
perhaps we would have waited a little bit longer to start the process of raising interest rates. So there is some, I mean, there is some truth that it might have made some difference, but I, I don't think it really made, would have made an extreme difference. My impression is, and this is uh, based only on minutes and transcripts, that people who want to raise interest rates have in the past said, look, uh, my projection of inflation is we're going heading over 2% if we don't tighten. Uh, I've looked at all the data on the natural rate of unemployment, the NARU, and you know, wage increases are just around the corner, and they use that as an argument for tightening policy. Do you think that this new statement will essentially weaken the argument of those hawks inside the committee? I think it will weaken the argument of the hawks inside the committee because the statement is very clear that the committee's objective now, after a long period in which we've had an undershoot of 2%, is to allow an overshoot to encourage an overshoot so that um, over time, an average of 2% inflation is achieved. And um, I, I think that the argument of, well, we're not at two, but look how tight the labor market is um, and we'll be headed to two very quickly. Um, we need to take a preemptive approach. This statement is really pretty clear that uh, the committee intends to take less not only to overshoot 2% inflation, but also to take a less preemptive approach um, to look less at uh, the tightness of the labor market as something that's a reasonable forecaster of where inflation is heading. They have embraced the idea that with a flat Phillips curve and with a great deal of uncertainty about um, what the natural rate of unemployment is, that uh, they shouldn't begin to tighten policy just based on the fact that unemployment is low and drifting lower, that they actually need to see something happening with respect to inflation. It's moving up before acting. And with that in the statement, I think it will make some difference um, in terms of suppressing the hawk argument that the times come to raise rates. Let me just ask Benajana quickly before I turn to Roberto and Julia. So what would you what grade would you give them for this new statement? You're both former professors. Do you want incomplete. To... Incomplete. Incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he preempted you, Janet. Wait, what do you <laughs> I, I, I give it an A. I agree that it's incomplete. Um, I I I'd say in terms of a constitutional document setting out goals and objectives, I give it an A. I think they have come to an excellent conclusion. They ran a very good process. They still need to translate this into something more operational. They need some forward guidance about the path of rates and asset purchases. One thing I would point to that Im impressed me that I think is important is that they did obtain unanimous support in the committee for what is a very significant revision of the Fed strategy with respect to monetary policy. And when you think about what they're saying they intend to do, they're saying that um, they intend many years from now when the labor market is strong and inflation is moving up um, to allow it to overshoot 2%, um, that they want it to overshoot 2%, and it's entirely possible when that time comes and uh, the present problems of the pandemic are long in the past and the unemployment rate has drifted to very low levels, inflation's at 2% that market participants will wonder, um, are they going to renege? Um, do they really mean that they're going to keep interest rates that low to have an overshoot? And so credibility, is important. Um, you could say, well, why not promise now? Just say we absolutely promise to do it. And the truth is 
Um, with a committee like the, the Federal Open Market Committee, there'll be new members um, who certainly have the option of making up their mind when they're appointed what they want. And even participants who are part of the process now, um, you can't bind their future decisions. So the closest, I think, the FOMC can come to making commitments is to put out statements like this and show that they have very broad based support. I think that was true of the original version of this statement that we adopted in 2012. It was all but unanimous support. And then it plays a very important role in the communications and essentially creates credibility in a commitment. So that's important, mm -hmm. you know, substantively, the major things they did, um, recognizing explicitly in the statement that we're in a new world with um, low value of the neutral real rate, that there's an tendency for inflation expectations to slip downward over time, that that would be dangerous and has to be countered through a makeup strategy uh, the change in the wording of the employment objective, I like the shift from um, looking at deviations of unemployment from its maximum level to shortfalls, um, as Lil explained in her remarks. Um, that means as far as they're concerned, the lower the level of unemployment, the stronger the labor market, the better it is um, for the economy, for lower income groups. Mm -hmm. And they're going to need to see something on the inflation side to interfere with that process. All of that, I think, are very good changes to the statement. So I give it an A so far. What, what I meant by incomplete was I do need to see, you know, some inaction, obviously. Sure. I'm a little more confident than Janet is about credibility, though. I mean, I think the Fed is credible on its 2% inflation target. There is such a thing as institutional reputation that you want to be able to make promises. And so you don't want to break promises, even if they weren't made by you personally. So I, I think that the credibility is a little bit less of an issue than, than, than some people think. Great. Um, Roberto? Is so is the market sold? Is the market now convinced that inflation is headed to 2.25% and we've solved the problem? Uh, well, no, <laughs> right? Uh, so <laughs> I think that's, a, that's the problem, right? So um, I think what the Fed did, I mean, I look, I, I agree with both uh, Janet A and Ben's incomplete. I guess it boils down to how tough of a grader you are. And when I was teaching, I was not known for being a tough grader. And so let's give them an A for effort, hoping that this would motivate them to improve them. But uh, what they did was uh, necessary, was absolutely necessary, right? So yesterday, I think we saw the estimate, the latest estimate of our star coming out and it plunged predictably. Um, if you look at uh, inflation expectations, and if you go a little bit beyond uh, just looking at break even, uh, if you disentangle true inflation expectations from the break-even rate, you see that those dropped about 40 basis points uh, back in the winter and spring when COVID first hit, and they haven't recovered, right? So in spite of this uh, change in framework having been very well telegraphed, and they haven't recovered either after Jackson Hole. I mean, they moved up three basis points, right? So the result is that the nominal neutral rate, uh, you know, these days is about 1.7%. Uh, uh, if you believe those estimates. Um, so, you know, the destination, the ultimate destination here, if we don't do anything, is uh, it's the same place where Japan has been for decades and where uh, Europe has been for uh, several years. And so we're next, right? And so I think the Fed deserves uh, absolute praise and credit and everything you want for tackling this problem because it's probably the most important issue that we can think of. Um, you know, I think uh, from the point of view of actually succeeding, I think what they haven't done is uh, they haven't told people exactly how uh, they plan to achieve this uh, higher inflation. You know, all we know is that uh, you know, rates are going to stay low for a long time. And yes, forward guidance hasn't taken shape yet, but uh, they, it will pretty soon. But those are the same tools that the Fed used in the past uh, during the recovery of the last crisis. These tools take us out of the Great Recession. I think in a very uh, in, in a very good way, but they did not generate uh, a lot of inflation, right? So I think uh, the markets can be a little bit uh, forgiven for being for now 
skeptical, at least until the Fed articulates a full uh, plan to, for, for how to get there. Thank you. So, Julia, um, how do you see it? Well, glass half full, glass half empty. Well, first, I'm going to register for Professor Yellen's class, uh, <laughs> so I can get a better GPA. Um, so I agree with Roberto that it's absolutely essential. And I want to highlight that one of the things that I think that the FOMC did that's so important is update their understanding of how the economy works. So to, you know, officially acknowledge that the neutral rate is lower, um, that that has implications for the conduct of policy, that the Phillips curve is flatter, uh, and that financial stability is a more structural part of the world we live in, um, and that the labor market is more elastic than they previously uh, believed it to be. All of these are really important. And, and I'll say that as, a, as somebody that was at the Fed and then was in markets during the last cycle, there was sometimes a disconnect between how the Fed talked about and forecast inflation and how markets and market participants did. And so to update that sort of official assessment of how the economy functions in, in this world and commit to reevaluating that every five years, I think that adds to the Fed's credibility. That may not be something that we see you know, right away today, but over time, I think that creates a more dynamic reaction function uh, that is flexible to the facts on the ground. Uh, and I think that will lead to better policy outcomes that could affect expectations over the cycle. And again, not immediately, because there is a deep history of, of missing on the inflation target. Um, but I'll also um, add that it's not just about inflation. And I think we're already seeing the fruits, uh, if you will, of this, um, this policy review. Uh, we had already gotten a lot of the um, early kind of hints and guidelines as to where we were going on this. And, and here I'm going to, you know, highlight that the tools and the understanding of the tools and how to deploy them has already borne fruit in the COVID recession. So, for example, one of the things that uh, Chair Powell and Governor Brainerd uh, and Vice Chair Clarida had already kind of highlighted in speeches before this recession was that they're more comfortable, well, proximity to the zero lower bound means the unconventional is now conventional. Uh, that balance sheet policy is now a standard part of the toolkit, not something to like, duck, you know, put back on the shelf and, and break glass only if needed, but that it will likely be deployed in the next recession uh, and that it should work in conjunction with interest rates and forward guidance in a harmonious way, not kind of the stop and start uh, pattern we'd seen before, and that you should go early and aggressive and that's exactly what they did when the crisis hit. And what they've effectively achieved is they, they prevented uh, a, an economic crisis and a health crisis that was global and significant in scope from becoming a financial crisis. So again, you know, the counterfactual will never know, but I think it's not an insignificant achievement in stabilizing markets, although, you know, I can't defend 500% appreciation of Tesla any more than you can, but you know, the fact that markets are functioning, credits flowing, that markets understand the Fed's new reaction function and that the Fed is deploying these tools, uh, learning the lessons of the past is already making, it will lead to a better outcome. Again, I think as Roberto highlighted, it can't, and, and Governor Brainerd highlighted, the Fed can't fix everything, but it can prevent worse scenarios from, from taking hold. And they've certainly done that. Ben, what, it seems it's jarring to find ourselves in a position where central banks around the world are doing everything they can to raise inflation and it doesn't seem to be working very well or not as well as they would like. So what, how do we explain that? What, what is it that has changed in the world that makes it so hard for something that for so long we tried to do the opposite? Well, the changes that the motivated the change in the statement are, you know, structural. First of all, the low level of natural interest rates, uh, which is partly due to low real rates and partly due to low inflation in a kind of a self-reinforcing way. Um, in the United States, we had the advantage that uh, inflation, we talk about missing the inflation target, but we, we've kept it pretty close to 2%. 
and inflation expectations are a little bit higher than in Europe and especially Japan. But we also know that if, if expectations get anchored at a very you know, low rate, below target, close to zero in Japan, that's very, very hard to break. So that's this, uh, these, these circumstances that make it, uh, make it uh, difficult. Um, it could be that uh, you need fiscal policy or other policies uh, to, as a transition to get you to a point where uh, inflation expectations and, and the neutral rate are high enough that monetary policy can be, can be play the role it's played in the past. But clearly, if you get yourself into a Japan trap type of situation, it's very hard to break out. And I certainly can't criticize the Bank of Japan for a lack of, you know, lack of uh, effort. They certainly have been very vigorous um, in their efforts. And so uh, that's not the problem. It's the, it's the structural issues that we've been talking about. Uh, Janet, what about the financial stability consequences of running low interest rates over time, driving up asset prices? Well, I do worry about the financial stability implications of um, lo a, a, a long-term environment of low rates. There's no necessary connection between low rates and financial instability. We have Japan that's had low rates now for decades, and I don't think you're seeing any real financial stability problems. But um, I think in the United States, the period of low rates, um, which was intended to support housing demand, touched off a bubble in housing prices, um, which began to lead a life of its own, even when rates began to rise. Um, we had significant asset bubble that led to a financial crisis. And we have even um, during this recovery seen some areas that are, let's say, bubbly, although not the same as uh, the housing market. Uh, corporate borrowing, uh, you've seen a huge deterioration in underwriting standards and um, great growth in non-financial corporate borrowing in commercial real estate. Cap rates have moved to very low levels. Um, so um, I, I think you have to worry about reach for yield behavior and touching off asset bubbles in this world. Um, we had something on that in the original uh, consensus statement from 2012. They have moved it and emphasized financial stability considerations more. But, you know, as Lael and others have said, um, it's certainly not the desire of the FOMC to be using monetary policy to address bubbles in financial stability um, concerns. Uh, if they get out of control, it can cause a financial crisis that undermines the attainment of all of the Fed's goals. Ideally, you would use macro prudential tools of supervision and regulation. But the truth is, in the United States, we just don't have many of them. Um, there's a counter cyclical uh, capital buffer. It applies to only to the largest banks. The stress tests potentially um, can lead to building up of capital buffers during booms. But um, again, it only applies to the largest banks. It doesn't apply to shadow banks. So I do think there is a lack of macro prudential tools that's of concern, especially if we think we will be in an environment as seems likely of very low interest rates as far as the eye can see. Roberta, where do you come down on the financial stability stuff? Are you worried? Are we building the world's greatest asset bubble here? You know, who knows, right? So uh, who knows is not the bubble. So, question. Uh, <laughs> you see the bubbles after the fact, right? But, uh, but listen, so I think the, the midst of a crisis is uh, probably not the right time to start thinking about financial stability. When you're in the midst of a crisis, you need to resolve to solve the crisis whichever way you can using all the tools that you can. And in that regard, I think the Fed has done an absolutely terrific job in terms of the timeliness, especially the response, the size of the response, the mix of tools that he used, absolutely terrific. Uh, you know, some of the consequences I think are, are, are still worth uh, thinking about it, right? So for example, look, the turning point in the market 
was not, uh, you know, when the Fed brought the funds rate to zero, was not when the Fed started buying massive amount of treasuries and MBS. It was, the turning point was March 23rd, when the Fed simply said, hey, we stand ready to buy trillions of corporate bonds, munis, uh, all sorts of assets across the, the, the financial spectrum. So that what really uh, resonated with markets, right? So the Fed acting essentially as a buyer of last resort to say, hey, if things go wrong, we're going to take all these assets off your hands and we're going to buy them. So that's what uh, provided the great value uh, for the market. And so the consequences of this, again, the result was good, desirable, right? The consequences are number one, a uh, financial, mar financial market, stock market in particular, that are uh, increasingly dependent on Fed policy. And two, I think, uh, David, you were talking about uh, with Governor Brainerd earlier about you know, this inequality. Um, you know, this type of policy probably uh, incentivizes inequality as well, right? Because again, the ownership of equities or corporate bonds is not uniform across uh, the segments of the population. So again, not the right time today to start addressing uh, these problems, but uh, at some point we need to talk about it because uh, we always say, well, okay, then when the crisis is over, we'll think about it and then we never do. Right? So I think uh, it, it seems something important to, to, to worry about it after this is over. Julio, do you, when you look at the outlook right now, are you concerned that, uh, as Governor Brainerd is, that the risks are to the downside? And although she didn't say it, there's a limit to what the Fed can do, and fiscal policy seems to be a little bit. Um, shall I say, reluctant? A absolutely. I mean, I think that we, what we've uh, done is um, allowed this virus to community spread such that, you know, eradicating it is no longer an option. And now we have to live in a socially distanced world. And so what we're seeing in the company reports and um, some of the moderation in the momentum in the labor market and, and the nature of layoffs that we're seeing, we're seeing a more normal recessionary dynamic take hold. Uh, so originally we thought, okay, this can be temporary. We shut everything down. We you know get testing and tracing in place. We, we go back to normal. We open everything back up and then we're just really careful. But now we're kind of in a permanently socially distanced world, which means you know, that wreaks havoc on small businesses, on anybody in the leisure and hospitality or travel industry. Uh, it changes the way we do business. These are deep structural changes. And we're just starting to see that, you know, really manifest itself in business planning and hiring and investments. So, you know, there's always winners and losers and, and that's, we're seeing that as well, but it does mean displacement uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and change. And so we're gonna see more permanent layoffs and then people that have to reallocate across employers and sectors or regions. Uh, and that's a, that's a friction that takes time to resolve. So that quick go back to normal scenario just doesn't look possible. Meanwhile, I guess one worry I have with monetary policy is they've been so effective in short circuiting the transmission of these real shocks into markets and markets used to serve as one signal to fiscal policymakers. And I almost worry that fiscal policymakers have become too complacent because markets are so well supported. Um, and so uh, the, the, you know, it, people like me that run the numbers of what this fading fiscal support means over the next coming months, it's huge. <laughs> We're looking at a huge pullback in personal income uh, and uh, support for small businesses. And it will have consequences undeniably, but it's gonna show up with a lag uh, and we don't have perfect high frequency indicators for this. So yes, I'm absolutely worried about those same things. Um, and oh, by the way, we haven't even mentioned the possibility of a second wave in the fall, which many epidemiologists say we should kind of anticipate. And again, that keeps us hunkered down and limiting our activity. And that just precludes the economy from being able to recover. So um, I absolutely uh, concur with, with Governor Brainerd's evaluation of the outlook. And, uh, uh, and it's a little bit jarring against that backdrop to see you know, how well supported financial conditions have been. Interesting. Um, ben, there are a couple of questions. I, I think these are questions you've heard before, but they're worth addressing again. One question is, 
shouldn't the Fed raise interest rates in good times so they have more room to lower them in bad times? So the Fed should, being preemptive in good times has benefits in bad times. And secondly, uh, if the recessions that we've seen recently have been more from financial excess than uh, too much inflation, aren't we risking the same mistake now, uh, aiming at unemployment and inflation, allowing financial excesses to build, and we're going to regret it down the road? Well, on the first one, the idea that you should raise rates so you can cut them, it, it, it doesn't make logical sense. You know, it, it's basically saying you should hit yourself on the head with a hammer so that you'll feel better when you stop. <laughs> raise, raise, raising rates too soon is going to cause a weaker economy and it's not going to help you in the long run. It's going to make you worse off in the long run. So you need to adjust rates in a way that's consistent with moving towards your goals in a, in a consistent way. Um, business cycles are, by the way, asymmetrical. Unemployment rises a lot faster than it comes down. And that justifies, I think, some asymmetry also in, in policy response. Um, on the financial stability question, I mean, I agree, it's extraordinary. <laughs> I, of all people, should recognize that financial stability is critical to the health of the economy. Um, and I share with Janet and others that we don't, the United States has not always done enough. I think we should do more. I'm concerned about the idea of actively using monetary policy, not for any religious reason, but basically because the connections, while they're certainly there, are so uncertain um, that you risk you know, significantly slowing the economy for really unclear benefits in terms of increased financial stability. Um, there's so many counterexamples, uh, like the one Janet mentioned of interest rates in Japan for decades being close to zero without any effect. And it's very hard to find examples globally, and I'm sure somebody will come up with one, but it's very hard to find examples of where monetary policy has actively deviated from macro stabilization goals and successfully uh, avoided a, a financial stability problem. Mm -hmm. um, most cases you can think of, you know, when the Fed, you know, for example, tried to pop bubbles, usually they tend to overshoot, the 1929 being the first example that would come to mind. So again, in principle, yes, obviously very important uh, to deal with financial stability risks. Uh, it's imperfect. The macroprudential tools and prudential tools are imperfect. But I think it's worth noting that we have made a lot of progress relative to 2007, and we take it much more seriously, and we got to keep pushing. People like Janet and, and, and I and, and uh, Nellie and so on uh, need to you know, let policymakers know that this is something that is of incredible importance. If the financial markets are so dangerous, then we need to think about you know, what, what can be done to make them uh, less dangerous to the economy. So, so yes, I fully agree that financial stability is a, a, is a central issue. I, I'm skeptical that monetary policy can be used in a consistent and effective way to deal with these problems. And like uh, Lael said so carefully using the formula, first line of defense, and maybe for me, the second line of defense should be um, more focused policies, uh, macro prudential, regulatory, and, uh, and, other, and other tools that are focused directly on the problem at hand. Mm -hmm. Janet, you're among the, among the many things you've been doing is sitting on some committee that's advising the governor of California. And there's a question from someone in the audience about how worried you are about state and local governments, their solvency, their ability to continue to deliver public services, the stability of the municipal bond market, given where we are right now. Well, I'm tremendously worried about state and local governments. I am on the task force uh, for the governor of California and um, California faces, I, I believe it's a $54 billion uh, budget shortfall this year. And um, his, we've been very much hoping uh, for some support for the federal government that would avoid uh, really very drastic cuts in public services and uh, cuts in employment um, you know, for basic uh, st state workers. I believe the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities has estimated that 
uh, over the next two and a half years, the state shortfalls add up to something like $550 billion. I'm not worried about um, municipal debt or state, state uh, debt because uh, these states all have to balance their budgets and they're all slashing um, spending in order to do that. Well, I'm worried about the economy. It only adds to the concerns that Julia described. We're seeing, a, we've seen a cutoff in the $600 a week supplementary um, unemployment insurance benefits. That's a substantial cut in personal income. I think it amounts to something like $16 billion a week. So we're going to pretty soon, my sense is that almost all of that was spent. We're going to see cutbacks in spending that um, weaken the economy because of that area of um, fiscal policy not stepping up to the plate, not continuing that, and state and local governments just add to that, but there are huge shortfalls and um, the more or less across the board cuts that we're going to see in state and local spending. Um, Roberto, one of the things you hear from uh, people, some in Congress, some just ordinary people is I used to think we needed to worry about the size of the federal debt. And now no one seems to be worrying about it, even the bond market. So um, why is that? And is this a, one of those latent worries that one day we'll wake up and discover that, oh my God, people are worried about the federal debt and interest rates will go up and we'll all panic and have to do something about it? Well, uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, there is a, snarky response to those who think in those uh, terms, right? So, well, you know, look at Japan, uh, 260 percent, I believe, uh, debt to GDP ratio, and look what interest rates are, right? So, but uh, look, I think the way we look at it is because uh, there is a reason why the government uh, has to issue all this debt, and the reason is that the situation is bad, right? So, there is a need for uh, to replace all this income that was lost, lost uh, because of COVID-19, because of the shutdown, and so that's a typically a situation that leads lower interest rates, not higher interest rates, right? Not just in the short term, but in the longer term as well because of lower R star and all the stories. So, uh, so I don't particularly think that this is the time to worry uh, about the debt. I'm not surprised that uh, market rates are uh, where they are in spite of the um, very, very large, uh, very large issuance. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, because rates are low, expected to stay low and I think correctly expected to stay low. I think this is the time to, to, to borrow, right? I mean, I don't, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know, in the future we may, you know, see rates spiking, whatever, but, uh, but this is not, uh, I think at this point, this is probably something for, um, well down the list of uh, problems that I would be worried about. Hmm. Julia, what, what do you, what would make you happy if the Fed did it in the next six to nine months in terms of fleshing out the framework? What specifically do you think they need to do to build the credibility so that Professor Pernanke will go beyond the incomplete and say they've finished the... Ooh, I get to give a wish list. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I think I would like to see more of a uh, tackling of the tools and an integration, a focus on the balance sheet and interest rates and how they transmit and how they interact. Um, I think this is an emerging area of understanding for the Fed. Um, and, you know, the statement still says, like, our primary tool is interest rates. But is it? <laughs> it it's uh, quite a balance sheet policy has been quite central to the current uh, cycle and will continue to be. I would like to see um, more of uh, thinking through and communication of how those things fit together, where they trade off. Uh, and, uh, and, and some more concrete guidance. I feel like in terms of thinking about how the Fed's gonna clarify its statement in guidance on interest rate policy and uh, bond purchases, the bond purchases are gonna be far more significant um, for markets than saying we're gonna be at zero until inflation um, hits 2%. Um, how long are you gonna be doing quantitative easing and how much and what are your metrics of success? I think that's gonna be something we'll be watching very closely. 
Um, so, so that's, that's a, a primary thing. And I was actually, I found Governor Brainerd's discussion. So I completely concur uh, with, with uh, former Chair Bernanke <laughs> that, um, you know, that some of these concerns about financial stability, they're very real, they're very central. Um, and we need to think about how to address them. So when, when Governor Brainerd talked about exploring, you know, supervisory and regulatory tools that can be brought to bear, I think is going to be a really important, obviously that gets political and um, has to interact with the political uh, environment. But I think that there are things that can be done that give the Fed better levers to pull um, to address that, because I think that is, I mean, they did strengthen and, and, and Governor Brainerd talked at length about the financial stability concerns. They're very important. Uh, they're very central to the modern business cycle. So the Fed needs more tools on that front uh, to address those. And I would like to see an exploration even in conjunction with Congress as to what those tools could look like. Hmm. Um, ben, uh, when you adopted, when you led the Fed to adopt formally a 2% inflation target, uh, the Fed was not in the usual, uh, it wasn't innovating so much as adopting what other people have done. Um, I think there's a sense out there that somehow the Fed has done something big now by switching to this, uh, I, I'm not sure I like the calling it fate, that seems rather uh, awkward, but <laughs> um, uh, this flexible uh, average inflation targeting. And I wonder whether you, you think it's as, as globally significant as some of the Fed rhetoric suggests? Well, as I said earlier, I mean, I think it's, um, this is this is a contingent policy. This is not a policy for the ages. It, it has to do with where the world is today. And the world is in a situation where neutral interest rates are very low. Uh, inflation expectations because of history are a little bit below target. Um, the uh, Phillips curve is very flat, et cetera. And this is a, probably a better structure or response than the uh, bygones be bygones approach, which was characterizing the traditional inflation target. So I, I you know, I, I was, I was being a little bit facetious when I said incomplete. I mean, I think it's good work, and I, and I think that this is a definitely a positive step. But I also think. They need to take seriously the five, as, as Lael did, the five-year review. Because if the world changes in, in in unexpected ways, this may no longer be the optimal structure anymore. Uh, but for now, I think it is an improvement. Um, I agree with Julia that they 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 need to work harder to figure out how the different tools coordinate with each other, uh, how they're going to think about financial stability, how they're going to add firepower and you know other dimensions. So there's a lot to be done still. This is just a uh, uh, aspirational sort of constitutional kind of statement. But I, I do think that in going towards um, going towards the two things, again, make up policies which try to create a, a more accommodative environment and trying to assure so critically that inflation expectations stay close to 2%, those two things are meaningful improvements. And while again, monetary policy is not going to cure coronavirus. Uh, this will set them up to do be more effective uh, in the world that we have going forward. And, and as people have been talking about how critical the, the public health situation is, I think, you know, there are, there, there are possibilities for vaccines and other things that could bring this to an end in the next year or two. And in that case, I think we could see a more rapid recovery and the Fed's tools would become more relevant uh, at that stage than they than they might be today. Roberto, in general, we talked about the Fed's tools. We talked about interest rates, uh, uh, the quantitative easing, uh, forward guidance. We flirt with the old curve control. Um, is that it? Are there things the Fed could be doing that we're not even talking about? Well, yes. Look, I think my. Um, Probably call it a problem that I have with this uh, traditional tools. If you want, is that right? They, in the end, they all do the same thing, right? So they they take interest rates that are already low and importantly expected to stay low for a long time, and they 
make them even lower, they keep them, keep them lower for an even longer time, which is good, right? Again, it's necessary, but uh, you know, the traditional, you know, the, the reason to do this is because uh, you know, the Fed wants uh, household businesses to borrow today instead of tomorrow, so uh, shift economic activity from the future to the present, I mean, simplifying a little bit. Um, so well, when rates are low and expected to stay low, this mechanism doesn't work very well, right? So the concern that I have is that these tools maybe are a little bit less powerful than they have been in the past when they worked uh, really well. So maybe something different could be done. And in fact, that look, even the Fed implicitly admitted, I think, that these tools don't work very well because the thing that they did during uh, at the height of the COVID crisis was, uh, you know, to uh, go into territories that you have never touched before, right? Buying corporate bonds, buying all sorts of other assets, or, or at least promising to buy these assets if needed. So, um, so I think I view, or at least uh, you know, I think that that type of policy can be viewed as an as a form of interaction with the government, right? Because after all, what the Fed did is uh, took money that Congress gave it and leverage it you know, for the purpose of stabilizing financial markets and the economy. And so maybe, so th those tools cannot be used uh, as of today in the normal course of business because they are 13-3, right? But, uh, but, but maybe there are ways to uh, explore further interaction, I think as Julia uh, was saying earlier, between the Fed and the government. And maybe look, we are already implicitly exploring these interactions because uh, one of the reasons I think why interest rates are, are not rising in, in spite of the big increase in, the, uh, in, in debt issuance is the fact that the Fed is buying a lot. Right. So uh, I think uh, um, we're going in a direction and other central banks have gone already in that direction of uh, uh, more integrated policy between uh, more coordinated policy between Fed and, uh, and Congress or Fed and uh, um, other branches of government. So I think that is uh, a promising direction to go in the future. Of course, uh, uh, it's fraught with uh, um, issues, right, independence, uh, all these things that uh, need to be thought about very carefully, but uh, I think in this situation of very low rates, uh, I think it's desirable to explore those uh, those possibilities. Do you mean that the facilities that we think of as temporary would become permanent? Well, they cannot become permanent, right? Because again, they are 13 three facilities, and so that's not uh, the way the law is today. They, that, that cannot be done. But uh, um, other forms of interaction, I think, are perfectly plausible or possible even without changing the law. Janet, does that scare you or make sense to you? Um, it makes sense to me that it would be desirable to, for the Fed to have a larger range of tools. Um, it would require some congressional reconsideration. Ben and I actually wrote a, a, an op-ed in the Financial Times where we suggested that the Fed be given permanent authority to buy corporate bonds, which is something that most central banks actually have. So a broader range of assets. Um, I, I do think in a situation like we're in now, fiscal policy is necessary and plays an important role along with what monetary policy can do. So um, I think there's a little bit more the Fed can do I would look at exploring the toolkit, but um, I think we also need fiscal policy in a situation like this. Hmm. And Ben, let me give you the last word. Do um, you think the Fed should be innovating on different tools than the ones along the lines that Roberto suggested? I, <laughs> I, think, I, I think it's always good to be creative and to be thinking about options. There's the choice of assets to buy, even as Treasury rates go to zero. Maybe corporate rates don't go to zero. Um, there's things like funding for lending, which uh, the European Central Bank has been doing pretty effectively. Uh, I'm not necessarily recommending these things, but I, I think that given the environment that, and, and, and there are the issues that Roberto raises about independence, et cetera. So again, I'm not endorsing any particular uh, tool, but I think that you know, given the research resources, et cetera, of the Federal Reserve, that they should be thinking about uh, alternative ways to provide stimulus uh, if the fiscal authorities are not able to, you know, do their part, so to speak. So uh, creativity is a good thing, but uh, central banks are also conservative institutions, and so there has to be a balance between those two, uh, those two instincts. 
Yeah, I, can, can I say just one uh, one thing? I'm sorry, but um, so I agree with everything uh, uh, Chairman Bernanke just said. I mean, I, let me just say I should have read Milton Friedman, but uh, most of what I know about helicopter money I learned from you and uh, from your blog post, right, on the Brookings website of a few years ago. I think that was uh, very interesting. I know you said that that something that should be considered only in uh, uh, extreme circumstances. Maybe we're a little bit uh, closer today to those extreme circumstances than we were a few years ago. It's no fair throwing his own arguments in his face. <laughs> ben, I just want to pick up on one thing before we close. I sense that your outlook, near-term outlook, was slightly more positive than some other people. You seem to have some confidence that we're going to find a medical solution here that will get us out of this hole and we won't have to be suffering for a long time. Am I misreading you? Yeah, I think you're misreading me. I, I think that, I you know, I don't follow the the daily data, the restaurant seatings as closely as some of my economist colleagues, because I don't think we're going to get out of this until the public health situation is under control, full stop. Yes. But I was saying that one reason, one, one, one scenario would be that you know, vaccines or other kinds of uh, interventions do significantly reduce the risk. And that would be an, obviously a very important step towards economic recovery as well. I see. Okay, with that, uh, let me thank uh, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, Roberto Perley, and Julia Coronado for joining us today. And for all the people who posed questions, again, I, I tried to keep track of the, one of the advantages and disadvantages of this remote thing is you can get lots of questions. The disadvantages, they seem to come to you in various different ways at the same time. So uh, I hope I did everybody, got a chance to get everybody's questions posed. Um, and uh, this was a lot of fun and you can watch the replay in a little bit on our website and pick it apart at your leisure. So with that, thank you, Ben, Janet, Julia, and Roberto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.